So um, we're just going to dive in. Sorry, I noticed I have to actually move a couple uh, tabs around. So, um, you know, obviously with 77% of sellers interviewed only one agent before signing a listing agreement in many cases. So 89% uh, used the realtor to sell their home and it's the highest percentage for, uh, since 1981. So most of these stats are you are actually up about 10 to 20 percent over the last decade. Um, you know, eight percent were actually done through FISBOs, and 89 percent that worked with the listing agent would definitely use their agent again. Now, it's really funny the number that's not listed is the percentage that actually do, because even though after the experience they say they're willing to use the agent again, because us agents are moving on to the next person and not keeping in touch with their client, many of those people are still up for grabs when they decide to make that. That next move. But um, again, a lot of these stats are up about 10 to 20%. There is a link um, that the National Association of Realtors has. Um, either Sandra will put it in the chat or I'll make sure I post it before the end uh, in the chat before we're done here today. Okay, so you know, initially you're going to have some sort of contact, right? Now, it may be a phone call, um, you know, maybe, the, you know, it's someone who's maybe not, uh, you know, wanting to, be, to, to talk as much and you're doing more email communication. But most of the time, at some point, when you're moving this process along for such a big uh, transaction, you're going to have them on the phone at some point, no doubt about it. Okay. So, um, you know, as you're kind of having that communication, then, you know, this is your first impression, right? Yes, they've probably looked you up online. Uh, maybe they've seen your, you know, your social media profiles and, and, you know, follow you through different avenues, but this is your first person to person interaction with them. So, you know, you're really, your goal is to be able to put them at ease, calm them, down, um, you know, be friendly. People can hear you smile, the number one thing on the phone, right? Because people look at the total package when they're assessing your demeanor. And when you're taking away things like sight, right, tone of voice in that can also be a little bit lost. So there's a big difference when you're out, like sound like this and you're on the phone than when you're like this. So that smile will physically change the tone and will make it a little bit more pleasant, right? So, um, uh, yeah, and then this is where you use a seller questionnaire. Um, you could have this partially filled in. This is where you're kind of having it to gather that info. Hopefully, you know, you're constantly prospecting, you're meeting new people. You're not going to be able to remember it all. So having a place where you begin your file um, is a great place to start. We're going to take a look at that in a sec. So, um, and this is where you're going to talk, you know, and you're going to ask these types of questions, right? Uh, maybe a little bit about motivation, where their thoughts are at. Um, you know, you got want to be careful how much you do on the Phone. It depends how well the conversation goes. Some people may just push for a face-to-face -face appointment. And some of these questions may get moved to when you're actually sitting down with them or having a Zoom call or something of that nature, right? Um, but uh, this is your first, uh, you know, but, but either way, as you get those questions, it's really good to have it documented, right? And you're going to actually just explain the process. This is what I'm doing step-by-step. Step. It really sets those expectations. Um, you know, some people have some misconstructions of how this should work. Maybe they think so. Uh, uh, they have an idea of how it should go. Uh, maybe they've had other agent experiences that aren't even going to be half as good as the one you're going to offer. So for you to dictate your process as an independent per as an independent business um, it is really important to kind of set that level of professionalism. And of course, you actually set the appointment. Right. And you're going to get the, you know, you set up your time and make sure everybody's lined up. Obviously, make sure that all the decision makers are going to be present. You know, if you're only talking to one person and, you know, there's several people on title or if there's a spouse, then you want that. You want all those people there at that at that beginning time. And if they're not available, then you move it to another time. It's that simple. Right. Uh, pick something that will work for to have everybody there, even if there's pressure. And one of the pushbacks you'll always get is, Oh yeah, just come over. You know, my other half, <coughs> my other half will be away, or my investors are out of town, and just come talk to me for first. But you know, you, you're really putting yourself at a disadvantage, and you definitely want to push to make sure that you're sitting at the table with everybody needed to sign a contract. Okay. Uh, let me exit. I'm going to be exiting in and out a couple times, so uh, excuse the hopping around. But this is the seller questionnaire. Now, this is in your supplementary, uh, your supplementary uh, add-ons that have been sent out. Um, you could make this 
a lot. Now, did someone turn their mic on? Is there a question? No. Okay. Um, if you can have your mic off when uh, when you don't have a, but if you want again, if you have something to say for those that have come on, I want this to be really open. Please just go Nathan, and we'll tackle it right then and there. All right. So um, now this is a seller questionnaire, very standard. It's basically just to give you the info that you need. But I would suggest, especially as you develop your branding and things like that, you know, redo this, make it your own. You know, add your stuff because sometimes too depending on like, as, as you hear from, you know, different sales strategies from trainers and whatnot, you know, some people will push to have the, the client fill this out, right? The mentality being they're getting used to signing paperwork. So you have them fill it out and it makes it easier to have them sign other things later, later on in the meeting. Um, so having this more attractive, having the branding in has its place, but this essentially is what a seller, seller question, uh, questionnaire is, right? Talks about how did they hear about you oh, look the newspaper so um you know uh, why are you selling your home uh what you're looking for in your future home things like that um even buyer questionnaires and stuff like you know depending uh what what the process that they're looking for then uh it's still really uh these are really good to kind of gather that stuff for your file all right and that is available to you So, you know, and then just to kind of before we move on some of the a couple of the other questions that typically, you know, um, you know, there, there's things in there that you may be asking when it comes to value and things like that. You'll see there that there's a lot of different questions and, you know, you'll get a chance depending on each conversation. You know, some people are, again, are going to be really open on the phone. You're going to start with a half an hour, 45 minute call because they want to talk a lot before you even get to the next phase where some people just be like, I want you to come over. So, um, you know, certain questions you may be able to get out. We're going to be reviewing a, a whole list of possible questions as we continue as well. Um, the popular one that likes to be asked when you set your appointment is, are you interviewing other agents right now? Um, and I think it's, it's, you know, some people would argue both sides of the coin because you could also say, you know, well, it, sometimes they're, look, 78% don't interview more than one agent. So why, you know, do you want to put that idea in their head to have them all, oh, why should we be calling other agents? Well, you know, it's still sometimes really like, you know, especially if it's a process where they've got, you know, because some people go the other end of the spectrum and they have five, six, seven, you know, they're calling the three local experts or something like that. And, and if that's the case, then you know how to shape some of your objection handling. So it is still really good to know. Um, I always really did like to go last. And if I could ever, because again, you don't want the objection when we have to talk to the other agents. There's some ways you can handle it, but it, it is, you know, people usually, if they've booked it, they want to give everybody a shot. So I usually really try to push to go last, but don't die on that hill. Don't let it make, you know, if for some reason, this is when they're available, they want you to come now, you know, don't be like, oh, no, 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 I have to come. It just, it, it looks weird, right? So, um, you know, just get, you know, if you're not the last one in, if you're the best, you're still going to win at the end of the day, right? So uh, just something to keep in mind. So a one step and two step approach. And, you know, you got to really assess the situation. Uh, before you decide what strategy. And sometimes you're going to be able to do a two-step approach no matter what, right? Because not every listing appointment that you go to is going to be, we're ready to sign today. Some of it, maybe they're in reno doing renovations, right? And they're like, yeah, come take a look at the house. Let us know, you know, and you have a chance to, you know, kind of go through and have that step, you know, that chance to, to walk through first. Sometimes, you know, it's a unique home and, you know, you want to have that point, but there are going to be plans plenty of situations where you don't have that chance, right? We're, we're bringing in three agents. We need to get it on the market. It's spring market. Look how hot it is right now. Come on, come on, come on, come on, right? So you've got to go in and, and just give it your swing for the rafters right out of the gate, right? So, um, but if you can two step, especially if you're not very well. Hey, the worst well. Hi there. Oh, it was a mistake. No problem. So, um, you know, so, you know, if you don't know the neighborhood, especially well, especially if it's a neighborhood that's a little more mature, you know, it's not, you know, 
not everyone had, you know, the builder didn't have X amount of, you know, of, of setups. And that's usually what it is. You know, if this is baby point or lee side, then you're talking about, you know, hundred year old homes where a lot of things have been moved around. So, um, you know, you've got all, so if you can get a chance to go into the house first, especially as newer to agent, it may give you a better idea, especially as you go and look at comparables, but really see, do you have that chance? Okay. Um, if it's a slower market, if it's, you know, if, if it's the off season or something like that, then you usually do tend to have that chance. Um, but if it is faster moving and if you don't have the shot, you, the, the baseline is, is you've got to be able to function both ways. Okay. And we're going to talk about opportunities also to get a look at the house beforehand and that that's where buyer booklets also have their place, but uh, we'll get there uh, eventually. Um, and it's always best to go in with the mindset and processes in place that you will be leaving with the listing paper signed. Now, again, I just said it, you're not going to every time. There's some people where they start talking to people, but they're been out. They may be part of a, you know, senior, maybe they're on a waiting list for a senior's residence and the waiting list average is anywhere from 18 months to two years, but they still want you to come in, right? You still want to have that relationship. You still want to have that initial meet to initiate those follow-ups and, you know, build your pipeline for two years from now, you're still going to be in the business, right? Retirement's a myth. So you might as well at least keep, you know, continuing to meet people at any phase. But if you don't have everything set up, because you don't know with every situation that you walk into. So, you know, you want to always go in with that intention, because if you don't go in with that intention, you're never going to take the shot and take it from me on a, like, I personally have had the experiences of easily walking in and I've had to walk out and say, oh, I'll have an appointment in the area. I'll come back in an hour. And I was able to because they were fighting me on commission, right? Um, but and I wasn't and they didn't want me to sacrifice any of the marketing that I was doing. So, you know, I, I two step, but it was still one I ended up coming back and getting the agreement, you know, within that day. So, um, you know, it really, you know, every situation is sort of different, but there's advantages to if you can get a look at the house first, especially if you're not uh, super well a custom or if there's custom thing or if there's um, particular things about that area where every house is not the same. Okay. And we've talked about making sure all decision makers are going to be at that meeting. It's a must at least. Okay. So uh, your, your seller's guide, right? This is a pre-listing book. Now this, you know, a lot of, you'd be surprised how many agents don't do this, okay? Um, a lot of people, they tie this in and part of it, you gotta be careful because there would be some, there could be some similarities between what your seller guide is and what your marketing, you know, because a lot of, sometimes your marketing plan stuff gets tied into your seller's guide. So, you know, your seller's guide can be a, a really nice, a bit of a summary of what it's going to be, um, but it really does give it that wow. And, you know, Right now, it's not very appropriate to necessarily always be going in houses unnecessarily, but at some point that's going to come to an end. And this is a great chance, you know, listen, I just happened to be in the neighborhood, wanted to give you an, a, a seller's guide just as just before we meet to give you a little bit of uh, information of uh, before we get started. You know, are, are you home right now? I'll only be five minutes. Maybe I can run through the house. Maybe that's your opportunity to get that quick run through and take those notes and, you know, figure out exactly what they love and, you know, and, and, and finalize your strategy a little bit more. Um, and then, and that's also when you're dropping that off, especially if you don't know the neighborhood, especially uh, super well, you know, that's where you take that look around, right? You can <clears throat> see, is there anything that's um, maybe listed? Maybe it's a part of a different board because you're on the cusp of a board. So you didn't see it in on the edge of Oakville because, you know, some of, you're only looking at Treb for some reason and it's on Hamilton exclusively, right? So um, things like that. And, you know, this drive around in the education. The other thing is, is for me now, you know, for those that know me, you know, I like to eat. So for me, I, um, especially when I worked areas where I didn't know the neighborhood, like the back of my hand, um, you know, I would go make sure I ate at one of the local places beforehand. So I could talk about it when I had that meeting, I'd make sure I knew about the local school and, and kind of got a feel for it. So I could drop those, those little extra nuggets. Now, um, you know, for me personally, you know, yeah, I'll get into some of that after some uh, what I used to do. So, uh, and then you prepare, oh, sorry, going to end up going back. Ah, that worked. Okay. So, and 
Hi, did someone turn their mic on? Nope, okay, sorry. Kim, uh, Kim your mic is on, I didn't know if you had a question. Um, prepare CMA. So that's where you actually, you know, you're going into TREB, you're going into, uh, you're going into MLS, whatever local board, and you're grabbing that information, right? You can use Geo Warehouse, double check the ownership uh, uh, that actually everybody who's going to be there is, you know, that needs to be there is going to be there. Um, and uh, do a little bit of a, and that's where you can kind of see, well, what is the competition, right? What's out right now? What has sold? Um, let's face it, there's not too many expireds nowadays, but, um, and it also, you know, lines up what you should be looking at before for your appointment, okay? Make sure you go see every house that's currently for sale in the area um, and comparable, even if it's not a super comparable, sometimes it's good to just, you know, have that extra knowledge and book it and make sure you, again, do that walkthrough and have those points. So I used to do that hours before my actual meeting. So a lot, some of these things, um, as far as driving around the neighborhood, educating and stuff, uh, because, you know, I would, I had a, you know, I had a lead generation machine that I had running and, you you know, I was running all around different parts of the GTA and, you know, that day, because, you know, and let's face it, I, you got a lot going on. My memory is not always perfect. So to make sure I was the sharpest, as far as what's going on, I would go a few hours before that appointment and take a look at everything for sale and whatnot. So when I walked in, I had that, that it was just all really crisp in my mind. And I was able to pick at very specific things to differentiate the houses. And that always will impress the, uh, the client. All right. Um, and then you prepare your listing presentation and put your listing package together um, and things of that nature. And that's where you find that fine line between your seller guide and your presentation. You don't want too much redundancy. So having your seller guide be a really nice um, gloss over of, you know, some of the state of the art stuff you're doing. And we'll talk about that later, as well as the great company that you're with and what we do for the community um, is a really good introduction. Then you dive digger deeper into that as you go into your presentation. Okay. Sorry. Um, sorry, just give me one sec. So um, there we go. So in your actual listing presentation, okay, this is your why use me, right? What do I bring to the table that's going to get you the best, best money and the best experience on your house sale? Right. So um, I am going to go through uh, a, a listing presentation that we do have that you can use as far as um, I guess a template would be the best way. You definitely don't want to use it straight out of the box. You want to add your own touches to it. We'll talk more about that after. Have it ready on a, a, an iPad or a laptop or, you know, sometimes even like I even a, for a short period of time uh, brought a projector uh, and I would plug my laptop into that. You can project it somewhere. Maybe you have cables and you can plug things into a television, but have a, a digital option that you're comfortable and that's easy. That's very easy to implement. And then also have a print version ready just in case maybe their eyes aren't great or, you know, the TV is not in the room where you're going to be having this talk, et cetera, et cetera, or et cetera, et cetera. But um, again, normally too, you just want to, you know, on an iPad or a laptop, you just want to have that. There was also a period where, let's face it, you can get those Amazon Fire tablets for like 79 bucks each, right? So you can be at the kitchen table or dining room table and everyone could even have their own device where you can go through it. So, you know, look at those different options, right? Um, now, uh, so we've got the, uh, and then be, be, be prepared to meet your seller's needs. So, you know, be able to customize is what I really think uh, that is what I would say. And so when you're looking at the house itself, and this is where, you know, the, you know, if you've been able to go through, if not, then you're kind of, you know, digging into your resources. But as you go through the house, you're going to see, because some houses, let's face it, they're spotless. So certain types of things that you would offer within your marketing budget for that listing is going to be different if, you know, maybe they were a little bit of a hoarder, maybe they do need to have certain other things done that would, you know, that would add that value, maybe even something that another agent won't normally add that'll make you look like a superstar, right? Um, and again, each situation is, is different. We're going to talk, be talking more about marketing options uh, is, uh, very soon. And show how your home will market and how what is the best choice. And again, there's room, you know, some people have a standard box, we do it this way. 
Um, but you know, there is room to really bring in things on a need to know, you know, on a case by case basis. Okay. And we're going to go through some of those. So just so you know, here's all the forms in a listing package. Okay, our front desk, your front, our front desks uh, have a lot of these lined up and ready to go. Um, really good to pre-do some of the paperwork ahead of time, especially if you're, uh, you know, you're going to be, you know, going for it. Um, and uh, yeah, this is uh, very easy to have everything lined up. So in general, right, whether this is a buyer consultation, a listing presentation, anything, right, there's no, it's repetition and muscle memory that makes you better at it. So practice, run through it, have your, have your uh, buddy hang out with you and, you know, and have them play a, a difficult seller, right, and, and go through different objections and that'll really, and it, it's saying it again and again, that will make it roll off the tongue like butter and will let people get put at ease and move on through the process, all right? Um, practice the list of questions that you'll ask, right? What are the certain ones? Dig into it, right? And when you ask these questions, don't be afraid to ask the hard ones. Don't, you know, what would you do if you couldn't get the price you wanted? What would you do if, if we couldn't sell your house, right? Is this, you know, like what is the real motivation? Right. So and getting in there, that's real. And that's what's really going to allow you to find out, you know, is this even worth your time too? right asking these real questions? You know, you're investing a lot of money in your marketing plan when you initially list without the guarantee of a payout until the house is sold. So you're interviewing them just as much as they're interviewing you. So. Um, and practice the common objection handling, right? Price, commission, fears, concerns. And as you do more and more of these, you're gonna notice that people are usually saying the same, let's use a number 10 to 15 different objections and wording them differently. So um, once you kind of understand what those key ones are, you just get better and better at answering them. So again, just don't, don't hesitate to, you know, be that crazy person sitting in your room talking to yourself, okay? It has its place. And of course, make sure you have absolutely everything you need, right? Listing package, the presentation ready to go, ready to sign them up and a buyer package, okay? And this is really important because listen, you're, you're sitting down and you're having a discussion and, you know, sometimes, you know, maybe this is the very first time it's face-to-face. -face. Maybe it's someone you've met several times before. Um, maybe you've had conversations with it with them and you already know uh, where they're at, but maybe you don't. And sometimes having that discussion, right, you may go into the house and go, wow, there's enough to do that. They're two months away from being ready, right? And they really want to buy first, right? And we all know anyone that's active in this market right now, the number one thing that is frustrating realtors is that they have these listings ready, but these people have to buy first. Right? And because the market is the way it is, they want to make sure they're secure. They're not remembering 2017 and those that uh, were there no, uh, that were selling that know what I'm talking about, but that got caught in the middle. But with this sort of craziness, people have the mindset that they want to purchase that house first before they put it on the market. So, you know, it, it, you know, we can handle that. You know, that is something that we can talk about as far as an objection. And there are things you could say as far as a sense of urgency and what did happen in 2017 um, and how people sometimes got caught really in the middle and got the short end of the stick. Um, but maybe it's, you know, again, maybe they're just not ready, but they're ready to buy, right? And let's face it too. Buying is a much more enjoyable experience. That's something we need to realize. Listing your house is stressful. Right. And we need to be empathetic to that fact. Right. We don't this person may have had raised their children there. They have all their memories. They have this. This is a really you know, uncomfortable situation for them sometimes. Uh, buying shopping. Shopping is a blast. You know it and I know it. Right. So, you know, sometimes, you know, your goal is to if for some reason you can't get that listing paperwork signed, you want to walk out with some form of commitment. You want to win. So if you can get a BRA signed then you're halfway there, right? You're taking them out, you're showing them houses, you know, that, that you're already even three quarters of the way there of you're going to be their agent when they sell. So um, have a buyer package ready as well. Okay. Um, hold on. Let me uh, take a quick second. Let me, let's go back to the handout. 
I believe there's a whole, there we go. Let's go over some of these uh, listing meeting questions that you can possibly go up, right? Um, how did you hear about me? You know, um, have, you, uh, have you met with any other agents? Um, you could sometimes ask who, right? Especially if you're a local and sometimes you know you're against some of the, you know, the regulars. Sometimes you're facing off against the same person again and again. Um, and that, but uh, don't don't be insulting to them, but that's it. So, you know, have you ever sold a home before? And some of these, again, you may not get all of these out, okay? Um, but it's really good to get your mind going because again, our job is to ask these questions because it's the information we get from these answers that are going to allow us to make the best plan of attack or even decide if we want to work with this person, right? We may get answers that make us think that uh, the investment that they want us to put or the investment that we need to put to do the best job for this house isn't worth it, right? So, um, you know, a lot of great questions here, uh, but definitely something to kind of, you know, just they're good to have in the bank and it's kind of like the cards and each time you're going to have this need to pull out different cards, all right? But I also think the more that as you have ones that you deem more important, making sure that they're in your repertoire, again, that muscle memory becomes really important. Any questions so far? All righty. So you, this, is, this is basically the whole process in a nutshell, right? You're arriving, you're building rapport, right? Have them walk you around the house, right? Have them show you the things that they love. Right? Because don't forget the things that you appreciate may not be the things that they appreciate even more. Right. Like, you know, especially like I, I remember I've done, you know, a bunch of sales in areas where it's a trades where, where the family's tradespeople. Right. And they're proud of the work they done. Right. And it's beautiful because they were able to get deals on this on on the supply on the uh, materials and then do the labor themselves. So, you know, look at my granite countertop. Right. And th those sort of things. And where we've seen it before, but that's what's important to them. So and, and again, you know, we've got to be able to be uh, to be able to see what they value so that we can kind of reflect that as we build our own strategies. So, um, you know, you're going through the documentation, you're saying, how things are going to work, right? Ask questions, um, you know, again, finding out what they love most about their home, motivations. That's where the walk through the property happens. You know, this is where you, uh, you would deep dive deeper into your value proposition, going through what you think, what marketing is best for you. Um, and, and again, and again, so like when choosing your marketing plan, you know, maybe you have one and this is what it's going to be. Maybe you went through the house beforehand and you know this is what you need. But if you don't, be open and always make sure that you've got, you know, the team together to do any certain situation within your scope that you're comfortable with, right? Um, because you may not do certain things all the time, but all of a sudden you walk through the house and wow, it could really use a couple coats of paint. And these people aren't really going to be the type that paints, but maybe if you offer to pay, have a couple painted rooms within your marketing plan that they just get wowed and that's what gets the signature, right? So, um, but if you don't have that painter ready to go and have an idea of your pricing, then, you know, it could go a very bad way, right? You promise it and then you can't do it or you promise it and then somebody, you know, it's a price that you didn't expect and it totally eats into your profit margin. So, um, you know, always like, even when I used to walk in, I'd have several, a lot of different tabs ready when I knew it was a one shot. And they, and cause I did a lot of laptop, you know, I would between everything and I would hop around based on the situation, okay? Um, Present your CMA and the suggested price range, right? Answer the questions and be prepared to handle objections and then get the signature. So that's hopefully how everything would go in a perfect world. So arrive 15 to 20 minutes early at least. Like, as I said to you before, I would show up because when I started doing a lot of online prospecting and that, you know, like, yes, I was, you know, I, I started my career in West Toronto and I would do a lot of stuff in, in, the, in the low easy one, E2, but when I set things up, I would do, you know, Mississauga, Oakville, you know, Brampton. So I would show up to these areas a couple hours early. And that's when I would go see the, the excuse me, the houses that were currently on the market right now. I would get myself into that right state of mind, walk around the school. Um, you know, and sometimes if I was there early enough, I would, that's when I would grab lunch at one of the local places and, and, and that. So, um, 
you know, that's where I would kind of, you know, make sure I was, I was in, I was in the zone right? When you go in. So, you know, I do the knock, knock, you know, and I, I sometimes, you know, if I haven't yet, I check out the outside of the house at that time. And, you know, I do the nice handshake, make sure it's not a wet noodle. Um, you know, always be positive as they're walking through, right? Don't grimace at things and things like that. This is all really, you know, don't forget, this is their home. So if you're judgmental, you, you're fine. You're not going to get too many things signed at the end of the day. Okay. Um, match their pace and like mimic there, you, this is where the power of kind of, you know, and, and you could choose, right? Some people, and I've had trainers talk about, you know, if they're slouching and walking slowly, then, you know, you can do the same thing. And there's that mirroring, mirroring sort of uh, concept, you know, that's up to you as far as on a physical uh, basis, definitely keep some distance, but um, pace, I think on speaking, is definitely more important. Um, you know, if they're talking and I've had people that talk to this speed and this is more my natural speed, so I can go like this. And then there's going to be other people where you have to go at this sort of level so that they're absorbing everything. So you need to be cognizant of what they're going, because sometimes I can talk to somebody like this and they'll get anxiety just by listening to me, right? And then you have someone who you talk really relaxed and slow, and I'm already thinking about what I'm going to do after this appointment right? Too slow. Come on, come on, come on, right? Know who that person is. And I think at least on a tone, uh, make sure that you're matching them. It's taking a second to take a peek at the chat. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Okay. Um, if they ask where you'd like to sit, so kitchen or dining room. Now there are stats out saying the kitchen is the best place to get business done and a lot of big decisions, but you know, you got to take it on a case by case. Maybe they don't have a need in kitchen. If the kitchen is a bar and on the other side, they can't sit, then that's not going to work. Sometimes it's one of those kitchen, those breakfast nook corners. Um, and it just doesn't line up right because you want to be across from each other. You don't want, you know, um, decider number one here and decision maker number two there, right? So you want them both right in front because you got to do that look and it's just, it's a horror show, okay? Have both people in front of you. Statistically speaking, the kitchen comes out on top. Uh, dining room is number two. And I wouldn't be surprised if in more cases than not, the, the dining, you know, the dining room table fits that profile. Um, but if the kitchen does do that, um, let them know that you'll be taking notes or uh, things like that. So if you haven't done a walk through the house or thing or, or that yet, this is where you can make some initial um, observations and make sure you have them written down, getting ready for the listing, the description, etc. Uh, and make and again, this is where you structure the meeting. This is what we're going to do, right? We're going to go through some questions, you know, go through your home like the eyes of the buyer, show you my mark, blah blah blah, and hopefully we'll meet your mutual decision. You're but you're setting the tone. To me, yes, you're talking about everything and you're making sure, um, you know, that, that there's nothing that's going to, that they can rest assured knowing that every point's going to be touched. But to me, what's really important is saying that we're going to be trying to reach a mutual decision to work together at the end of the day, right? You're setting, it's almost like a pre-close, right? We're here to see if we can do business, right? Right. And if you start getting pushback, then that's where you can start digging deeper. So, under, you know, understand their needs, really take a look and go through it. Uh, let me just take a second here, sorry. Okay. So, um, you know, this is where you can really dive into those questions that we reviewed before, right? Really find out what, you know, why are they moving? Right? Why? What's going to? Um, what are they looking to get the most out of this? Right? What's their timeline? If you could be in your new home at any time you want, when would that be? Right? If they found the perfect home and got the price they wanted next week, are they ready? Right? So, um, things of that. Right? Um, this is a one of the really good questions to ask, and this is. This you're going to hear, you know, this you, you would, you'll probably hear again if you continue to educate yourself through other avenues is that ask them what they think their house is worth, 
right? You've got to sometimes, again, your work, you want to see what their expectations are. There's so many, you know, between different websites and, and different, uh, um, and different TV shows and this and that. Sometimes everybody's a real estate agent, right? They type their stuff into, you know, some automation and it gave, and it spit out some number. They may ha have a price already in their head. And that gives you a good base to work off of whether you've got to have uh, conversations about um, maybe that's overvalued. Maybe you've got to adjust the strategy to get them to that price. You know, it, it just, it gives you a really good starting point, right? But I've also been given the answer because I used that one quite regularly. Like, did you have a price in mind? And sometimes they'd say, well, I thought this is why I had you here. It literally, I know it's happened four times. Okay. So, you know, when you get that question, you'd be like, no, you know, like you got to be careful, but you know, anyways, just, just something to mention. So, uh, and what is the readiness to list, right? Again, what is their timeline, right? Are you here to just build the relationship, give some good information and, and make them a, you know, a B level a person in your CRM that you're going to follow up with and chase? Um, or, you know, do they see the opportunity of what's going on right now in the market and want to seize it while the getting's good and, you know, moved and either down, you know, downgrade their space or move to something a little bit bigger, maybe outside the core, right? So ask them what they love most about their house, right? And I kind of touched on this before and, you know, what renovations they did. Because again, even with the renovations, you may not see everything, right? If this is a really hands-on individual, the stuff they may care about, maybe, maybe they doubled down on the dry, on the thickness of the drywall, right? Maybe they did, you know, they, they did, did some extra stuff with the studs, right? Maybe the insulation is triple thick, Right and things like that, you won't be able to see all of that necessarily. So, um, and you haven't done the pre-home inspection and, and things like that that you could have um, in your marketing plan. So, um, definitely something to uh, to keep in uh, to kind of keep in mind. Right? What are the problems? What are the latent defects? Is there a little bit of a drip? Was there a history of any sort of leakage? Was you know it, we had a couple extra floods over the last five years? Did any of those uh, result in water coming into the house? Right. Um, so, you know, and again, just don't be negative. Okay. Everything can have a positive spin on it. Now, as you're asking these questions, you're getting the seller questionnaire filled out, uh, you know, all of those other things, you know, this is where you, again, you're interviewing them just as much as they're interviewing you. So do you want this client? You know, oh yeah, you know, my cousin's a realtor and they're going to do it for 0.5% and do, do all this work or are they yelling at you already about something or, you know, is there something that just makes you like, you know, so if you get a bad impression, your gut feeling is usually right. And don't hesitate. And I know sometimes you want that listing. Let's, let's face it. Listings are gold right now, but if you think that it's more like a bad client can just suck the energy out of your soul, right? And you could spend weeks uh, recovering from the amount that they took from you as far as time and energy. It's just, it, it can be insanity, right? And if you've been in the business long enough, you, you have that, that, those type of stories. So um, choosing, you know, do you want to work with this client and do I want this listing? Like, you know, if it's overpriced and they expect full staging and, and a discount, then, you know, this is where you're like, well, maybe I'm better looking for another client. Okay. Um, and do you understand what their concerns are, right? Uh, and what really matters to them? And that's where asking these sort of things beforehand becomes so important, okay? And do you even have a chance? Like, are you, you know, are, are they giving you a lot of signals that, you know, you're just kind of here to get and give a number and go away? Or are you getting feelings that there's, you know, a connection and there, this is something that they would trust you with as far as the, pro the process and the sale, okay? Um, so go back to the kitchen, kitchen table, dining room table, you know, start going through your value proposition. This is where it needs to cover everything, right? This is where you dive into those specific details. If in your seller book, you only maybe talked about, you know, top technologies and all these other sort of things, then this is where you can dive deeper into this is what your house needs to get the most money. And, and this is where you can, if you have examples, 
if you have examples of, of what can be done and, and uh, different things, this is when you start to show it, right? This is when you also talk about the company, right? And you can go into things like that as well. Um, and what makes you stand out, the Shelter Foundation, et cetera. So there's a lot of things you can do, right? There's, you know, the, the amount of money you can spend on a listing is, you know, it's, it's endless. And, you know, everybody at some, a lot of agents at some point have overspent and it, so, it ends up being more than they thought. A lot of time that has to could do with staging. We'll get to that in a sec. But um, don't forget two things to keep in mind. One, you're not just marketing the listing, you're marketing yourself to other sellers within that neighborhood. Anyone else in the, in the area that's thinking real estate and that owns property is judging you by the marketing that you do. So use it as a chance, especially if you're geo farming, use it as a chance to you know, build that rapport within the neighborhood. Now, the other thing to keep in mind is the top teams, everybody who really gets down and has systems and processes running like a well-oiled machine, always plan to get at least one buyer client that results in another sale from every listing that they get. Actually, in most cases, I hear a bigger number than one sale. But if you, you know, you, your plan in place should also be there to help you get buyers, right? And help you get other clients. Your listing is your best marketing tool. So, you, you know, these sort of things that you do utilizes that as much as everything else. Right, um, especially with open houses. Uh, let's before I get all over the place, we'll go through. But people say that about open houses all the time, right? Open houses don't usually sell the house, but you know people do it to get more clients. So, um, but there are some bare necessities, especially as we get more digital and that. Now, hopefully, most of you for your you know for most of your career was using professional photos and video tours. Um, you know, the, obviously that has really become more prevalent going into, uh, as we got into lockdowns and whatnot, it, to me, it's a bare necessity. Okay. Um, the prices are really reasonable. Lots of companies, uh, can do these two bare things anywhere. I think I see it in the two to $300 range starting, right. And that'll give you a, a, a video tour and a professional photo really going through now to add on to that, that those video tours are not matter poor. OK, um, those video tours are usually they have the camera and then they're scrolling while some, you know, hit, while some music uh, is playing in the background. So um, but then the next step up from that are things like Matterport, iGuide 360. I only really dealt with Matterport um, when I was doing these. They're a lot more comprehensive. It's a click and play. They're actually VR compatible um, and it gives you a real full. It's like a dollhouse shot and it allows you to click through and really really tour the house and get a look, right? And there were during the last lockdown, a number of sales that were done sight unseen uh, with some of these technologies, but with their pricing and uh, really over the last 12, 18 months, I, I think, you know, basically it's at the point where everybody does it, right? Um, so you want to make sure that, you know, whatever company that you're using, you've got somebody set up and this is kind of your, the, your initial part of your offering, okay? Um, staging is something that you hear of a lot, right? Free staging, things like that. Staging to me has two different definitions, right? There's a consultation and that's where the stager comes through and they give their advice and it uses the stuff they already have to optimize the house. Okay, and those are usually, um, I see those usually in the two to $300 range for a consultation. Um, if not, then the other step is actually uh, is actually renting furniture. Now, um, sometimes you can use the staging company and then the furniture is rented and they take care of everything. Some realtors do buy their own stuff, right? I know realtors that have storage containers and they'll have couches and, and a variety of pillows and mirrors and different paintings. And, you know, and it's, you know, it's sometimes it scratches that shopping itch that they have, but they, they keep that, that for that. And that's their niche. And they walk through and they've got a real eye for interior 
interior decoration and things like that. So if that's something that is within your wheelhouse, if that's something that you want to have as far as your specialty as a realtor, then you could step up and, and have that inventory on hand. And then it's really easy to offer it within your packages now. Um, but if it's renting, it's, it can become thousands quickly, especially if the house doesn't sell right away, right? Most of your initial costs, you're thinking, oh, it's gone in 30 days. Well, if you start hitting two, three months on the market, you've got to keep that staging up. Like this is a couple, th two, three, it depends on the square footage and how much uh, furniture, but it can be thousands of dollars a month in no time. So uh, really be careful what you commit to before you say you're going to stage a, a property. All right. Um, again, I know lots of people where they've spent three, five thousand dollars on staging. It was a multi-million dollar house, and then they didn't get the sale at the end of the day. And then you're eating that money, right? So open houses have obviously changed a lot, you know, over the last 12 months. Um, you know, we did move a lot to a virtual atmosphere. Please make sure you know how to do them virtually. Uh, there's, I think, a lot of opportunities as well. Just like normal open houses, you can prospect with a virtual open house, okay? I think they're absolutely fabulous. Um, if Now, some people will swear against them, right? You don't have to do, again, you don't have to do every single thing on this list. And some places are not made for open houses and you know what I'm talking about right you walk into that house and that's you know it's it's going to be by appointment only so um but you know and some people just hate open houses they just do not think they're an effective use of their time um if you're going to do them do them well you're going to have other people that swear by open houses right um and if you do them properly then you can really utilize them to either bring in new uh bring in traffic or make sure that uh or, or may, meet a new client right and that's the that's really um that's yeah so you know and, and when it comes to effective open houses you know that could be things like door knocking the neighborhood beforehand when you're allowed to and this is also when you're able to do in-person open houses again uh, it's been over a year since those have been appropriate but you know there's a lot of things that you can do to rile the neighborhood up to have them come and you know it really helps you build your market share within that pocket so um feature sheets so there's, you know, feature sheets is a very broad word again, right? You could just print out the listing and some people just leave copies of the listing in the front, right? And then you can have really elaborate feature sheets made with beautiful pictures and, you know, things that people can take home, um, you know, and, and that, um, you know, CMS, our corporate marketing service does some really good print. And there is a lot, again, if this is a luxury home, and this is also knowing your your client, right? Some people love paper. If this is a, you know, a boomer, uh, they may appreciate a lot more, uh, a, you know, these booklets, you know, that that some of luxury agents do that they, that are just the feature sheet for the house. If this is me, I'm a digital guy. So I'm in love with what like corporate marketing service has this digital feature sheet that is absolutely fabulous. So if it was me, especially, you know, in 2021, I'd probably have a QR code on the wall. If, you know, if I was actually having people in an open house, people take a picture of the QR code and I have a go to the digital, uh, go to the digital feature sheet. Everyone's got their phone and they can just look through it, everything, you know, and it's something still that they can take home, et cetera. I'm not, I'm not a big fan of paper, but your client may be, and I'm not the one making the decision at the end of the day. So if your client wants, you know, that sort of, it's something worth having in your bag, in your arsenal. And again, you know, you can have it reflect the level of the house, depending, you know, like if it's a luxury house, you probably want something a little more bound or something like that. So what is your online strategy? Okay, and this is something, this is again, and I've said this already a few times, it is a broad word, but you've got to show them what you're doing digitally to drive, you know, drive exposure. So this could be targeted ads and, you know, and this could, and maybe you're doing this yourself. RLP Sphere gives you all the tools you need to, to take your listing and put out boosted ads. You can put out landing pages that people have to sign up for your stuff to get access to your Matterport tour. And then the mat, and then that information could go directly into your uh, Sphere CRM. And then you can have follow-up campaigns initiated. And this is all through automation. Right. But how are you keeping in touch it, with these people? How are you getting the eyes out there? Right. Your social media channels. If you're heavy into social media, then your social media becomes one of those tools. Right. Um, it, it, maybe it's your database. 
So, you know, if you have, you know, some people, you know, if you've got, if you're doing a lot of online prospecting and you're, you know, gathering up investors and different people and you have your CRM well, uh, well groomed and they're in different groups, that becomes part of your tool. You say, I have this database of all these people, right? We send it out. These are buyers looking for, for inventory. Right. And that because and that's something that you can say you have that maybe they don't have. Right. So, you know, you're always looking, especially if you are in competition for the business, what are those things you can add that make you look unique? OK, so um, drone work is something that's becoming a lot more common. Um, if it's uh, the same company that usually does your photos, your tours, your Matterport, they'll usually uh, many of them have a drone service as well. Uh, it, initially, it was largely done just for rural properties and things of that nature. But now you're seeing it a lot. You know, people will do it to highlight the neighborhood. Oh, here's the local park. And let's face it, it looks cool. Right. You put some, you know, like electronic music in the background and it looks like every YouTube video, right? So um, people are doing a lot of that still with drones. And it is um, pretty affordable now because once they have the drone, they just want to keep it running because, you know, they, again, it just, you know, they, once they paid for it, then it's, uh, there's that upfront expenses done. So, um, and there's tons of niche stuff. What I didn't add here, so we'll go through, oh, sorry, I'm going to go back to my mistake. What I didn't add here is paying for the status certificate and or the pre-home inspection, right? And that's something that you can definitely have within your marketing plan, especially in this crazy, you know, in, with crazy multiple offers, huge amounts of, of uh, traffic coming through, um, offer dates, you know, paying for a pre-home inspection is definitely something that you want to consider. Um, you know, it gives your buyer that, that better chance of getting an offer with no conditions. Uh, same goes like, let's face it, condo market, you know, we all know it's been a little slower than we wanted the last few months, but what it's done in the last few weeks is epic. Okay. And it's really starting to pick up. So if you start to see multiple offers, um, you know, and you think that could happen, then pre-ordering the status certificate for that condo will again, allow you to maybe have that condition waived. Okay. Um, newspaper ads and flyer in the area. <sighs> Newspapers are getting, you know, it's kind of who read, you could say the who reads a newspaper thing, but there's a market, okay? Especially like I will say for central Toronto, there are pockets in certain, you know, and certain um, uh, areas of people where they really look at the Globe and Mail and they really want that. They think the newspaper is where you put it out, right? It could also be a newspaper that maybe uh, hits a certain market, right? If you have a certain demographic that's within that neighborhood, maybe there's a specific cultural newspaper that you can then have your ad put into that targets that market. So, um, you know, that may be their flyer in the area. Uh, again, you know, meme paper, I'm not a massive fan, but it does have its place. And, you know, especially if you're working the area um, and you're doing some level of geo farming, etc. cetera, uh, it's, it's something that you want to have in your arsenal. Uh, a wine and cheese event, especially, you know, this is when you're able to do them, but on luxury homes, you see a lot of those gets the whole neighborhood in. Think of it as like an evening open house. You do it from say seven to nine and you have wine and cheese and everything you would imagine, right? Um, cleaning and storage services, if they have a lot of stuff, if the house is maybe a little messier, they're having problems maintaining it, have those people on hand, know to call, how much is a pod for you to store someone's stuff for three months, right? Have that factored into your commission structure. Always have a cleaner ready that's going to be able to rip through the house within a few hours and make it sparkle. Okay. Or use of a handyman. Now, this is a sliding scope um, because a lot of people, you know, like, like, let's say now it's having a handyman that will quickly come to do like $500 of little things is priceless. When you find a good handyman, you hold on to them for dear life because the good ones are always busy. So, you know, you, but it's really good. Like, and it could just be those little things. Maybe you're painting just a little bit of the outside door, fixing a couple nail holes, little things like that. But, you know, I do know of agents whose plans are, they do a lot more, right? They'll, they'll lend, you know, way more money to do basically small renovation work. Um, and they end up, uh, and they end up trying to, and they recover their money on closing. 
Okay. Um, something you can consider as well uh, as you're kind of balancing your stuff out, right? If, if they need a lot of upfront money or they're trying to ask you to do a lot upfront, um, keep in mind as far as the length of your listing. You know, if, if they if you're going to pay for staging and you're putting, you know, multiple thousand dollars up front, well, then you should have a six, eight month listing. But, um, you know, if it's, uh, you know, but if, if they want all this sort of work done and you need to protect yourself, then you could always have something extra, at least uh, in the in the listing, saying that uh, you will be reimbursed for any of your expenses if they don't uh, if they don't sell with you now. It, you still have to jump through hoops in order to get that, but sometimes it at least sets the tone of the expectations. Okay, just something to consider. Okay, now as you kind of move this way, you know, as you go through all the great things that, that about Royal LePage and marketing and, and things like that, this is when you start transitioning into pricing. Okay, we're going to talk about what's the market telling us? What do you, you know, what's been going on in the last few weeks? Okay, and offer a price range, right? And now in this market, you may have to give two different types of prices, right? You could give, you know, if we were to list what it's worth based on the comps, or what are we listing it at because we're holding off offers and we're having an offer date, right? Sometimes those are two completely different prices based on your strategy. So, you know, you've got to be realistic, especially with the craziness of the market right now, but offer a range, okay? Don't give any, you know, that's, and, and have that range be similar to, you know, based on the price of the house. If it's a lower priced house, I usually try to keep it within 20000 right? I, I range, but if it's bigger, you can probably go a little bit further, okay? In many cases, they may think it was higher, right? It isn't uncommon for a seller to think their house was worth more, okay? So um, ask the, if you haven't already gotten that number, then ask them what you think that number should be, right? Um, you've gone through comparables with them. Show the, ask them where in the comparables, do you, they like, you know, what makes this one stand out more than you? This is where taking a time and really looking at each one. And don't forget, they've got to believe you. They're going to fight you more if they don't think you're knowledgeable about the information you're giving. Because then they think they can argue with you if everybody's just looking at the same sheet of paper. That's why you going through the houses beforehand can really, you can really talk about the nuances, that, that make that difference of this is where I think you need to be as far as pricing goes, okay? Make sure you talk about the risks of overpricing. And if you've been in the industry long enough, you probably have a couple stories from personal experience you can uh, dig in on and talk about what, what uh, has happened and you know how much it ends up costing them by trying to, to get a little more than they should right in the starting game, okay? Um, and figure out if they're okay with that. Right. So, you know, once you've kind of come to that price and you've come to that um, and you come and everybody's comfortable with everything, that's when you start moving on to the closing process. So um, this is a really good closing question. You're going to see this in several different laid out in several different ways. Um, but really, you want to ask that closing question. So, you know, li listen, with all things being equal, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, if we could agree on a price that works for you and uh, a price that we're happy with and, uh, and, and a commission rate that works for everybody, is there any reason that we couldn't get, uh, we couldn't start you listing your home tonight? And you're looking for a yes or a no, or, and if you get a yes, then I would be stopping the boat and you tackle those objections right then and there, okay? Um, you know, and then and some of the things you'll commonly get are things like, you know, what is your commission and will you reduce it? And this person will do it for that and all those sorts of things. But um, let me just, so if you go into your supplementary, um, sorry, please let me get out of this. If you go into some of your supplementary add-ons, I believe there is, now this is, uh, I think, provided by, uh, oops, nope, that's a really good one. Actually, I really like this, but this isn't what I was looking for. Um, but it's some really good definitions of, you know, on, on different wording you can use and how to play with it. I would, th this is, I really liked when I went through this. So please take some time and go through the list uh, of answer seller statements and questions. Um, but what I was looking for, oh, 
Oops, hold on one sec, I'm sorry. What I'm looking for is there should be objection handling. That's what I was looking for. So this comes from uh, courtesy of Richard Robbins. Um, uh, for those of you that don't know him, he is a fairly well-known uh, real estate coach and he's an Ontario boy. So that's why we like him. So um, listed a higher price, right? The seller wants to list at a higher price. You can emphasize the listed prices. I'd rather see you get 10 offers and turn them all down than have no offers at all. Wouldn't you agree, right? Especially in this sort of market. So really great objections that you can tackle. Um, you know, if we want to think it over, right? And there was one here that I really liked. One sec. Uh, other agents for an interview. So if you go, so like this is the other one too, right? If they say, well, we have other agents coming in and that, you know, oh, this happens all the time. Agents work together. I'll give them a call and let them know. That seems a little aggressive to me. I'll be honest. And some people may still want to. So that's, you got to be careful to not be too pushy. Um, but again, you've got to sometimes ask for the close three, four times before you get it. So, you know, if you don't think you're going to get a second chance, I'd rather do this than lose, lose the listing. The one I love is right here at the end. And when I hear that there's generally one of three issues stopping you, uh, what, sorry, when I hear that there's one of three issues stopping you from going ahead, either you're not satisfied with the price, you're not, con you're concerned with the commission rate, or you have, don't have the confidence that I can sell your home. Right. Can you let me know what, which issue is that, right? That was, sorry, what issue is stopping us from working together today, right? And I love that question. It's upfront, it's in your face. It's that one that to me is, is a big one. Um, uh, the uh, Luba, the um, link to all the supplementary stuff, I think uh, Sandra actually posted it in this, in this chat, okay? So, you know, some really good stuff. And those are the sort of things and, you know, things like commissions are always going to come up, right? You, you know, I've even seen people do structured plans where they have platinum, gold, and silver, and they have different rates. And, you know, and this is, this is what you can offer and you need to set the tone. So, you know, but again, this is, you know, sometimes this is the only chance you're going to get. So, you know, try to answer the objections you can, try to get over those humps and, um, and uh, see if you, you know, you, you don't, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take, right? Now, they may not all be signed. You may go in there knowing you are not getting it signed. And that's okay, right? So, but it's, this is where your follow-up strategies are become the all more, all the more important. So if you're in competition or you know they want a list sooner than later and they ha and, and you're not able to get a signature right then and there, um, then, uh, then that's when you want to set that next appointment. At least you don't want to leave without having a follow-up appointment sent. If they're doing more renovations to the house or want to fix things up or declutter it and they want to wait, then okay, well, you know, and set a time frame: two weeks, a week, you know, have that set up for you to come by and take another bit of a look, right? Um, some people do thank you cards after this as well. If you are in competition, you weren't getting that listing right out of the gate, even if they like you more than everyone else, you know, sometimes you can drop off that sort of uh, thank you card and things like that, right? Um, and that's, that's sort of it. So um, let me take a look. Let's look at the listing presentation here. So this is a good basis, okay? I want you to kind of keep this as as a base that you build off of, right? Because sometimes people don't want to hear the stuff of every aspect of this. Um, you know, some people just, you know, some, some people you've got to have, you know, a different type of conversation with, but elements in here should be throughout your presentation. Okay. You know, what do you do? What do you, you know, what are the sort of things that you do to make sure that you, they get the best experience possible? What, why does Royal LePage make a difference, right? Why is it, why is it better that you're with Royal LePage compared to the other community, the other brands? Okay. What are you doing? You're saving them time, right? Establishing market value, right? You're going to do the negotiation. Now, again, know your audience, right? If this is a very educated client, uh, they're going to roll their, some of this looks a little too uh, preschool, 
for, for them, right? If they've done a lot of sales before and things like that, you may have to tackle this a little bit differently. But trust me, as someone who has used a much similar, like even 10 years ago, a lot of these basics haven't changed, right? In my presentation, when I was meeting brand new people through online prospecting, it was a very cut and dry sort of, this is how we work. And, you know, a lot of people, you know, yes, there's some that are experienced and maybe you only work exclusively with professionals, but there's lots of people that need that education. So for you to kind of walk through the process um, when they need it is fine, but know when to kind of skim over things, so to speak, right? So even marketing your home, this is when I would be going, like I would be expanding all, all of this, right? I'd have, have separate tabs. I'd be showing my different results on, on uh, my Facebook stuff and, and uh, different things. Because don't forget too, the other thing I love, and sorry, I'm hopping around a little, but I want to go back to some of the digital stuff is, you know, right now, like if this was a condo and this was a few months ago, then this would become more relevant right now. Everything's getting a little hot, but let's say you have to ask for a price reduction. Let's say that time comes. Right? You now have to prove a case that you've done your job, i.e. shown the property to the market in order to get that in order to get that reduction. If they don't think you've done your work, they're not just going to blatantly drop the price. Now, I know you can resort back to you know, the amount of showings you've had on the property and that, but the metrics from your digital marketing are also a very powerful tool for that. So knowing how many people clicked on the, looked at the Matterport tour, how many people did this and that. So the market, the digital marketing especially gives you metrics that become that, uh, become that tool if you do need to ask for a uh, reduction. So um, but I would be expanding this whole section into multiple slides and, and really wowing, right? This is what we do, right? And of course, you talk about the MLS service, goes on royallepage.ca, which gets huge traffic, you know, incentive marketing tools, all that other sort of stuff we've reviewed, okay? And you'll see as we go along, you know, different marketing for the home, uh, minimizing the risk, you know, lock boxes, things that I can do, you know, and that's where, you know, it, listen, it's maybe if somebody's really nervous about having people over, you know, let's face it, there's, we've all had listings where we had to be there for every single showing. Right. So, you know, sometimes that's where, you know, the things that you do on the security side, I know I, I have heard of agents that install a couple cameras now at this point. Right. And they'll put because it's not really an expensive thing to do and you set it up through the Wi-Fi, et cetera. So um, what are you doing on the security side? I think security and what isn't in here, which can really ask is what what type of COVID-19 risks, uh, health you know, precautions are you taking? Right? I think that's definitely something that should be a slide in here. So, you know, a lot of room for you to make this your own. You want it to pop. This is your presentation, right? This is where you have to dazzle. So dazzle, okay? This is about Royal LePage, how awesome we are, right? There's nothing here specifically about the Shelter Foundation and there should be. Oh, there we go. Never mind. Forget what I just said. I just ate my words. So, um, you know, raise more than 27, help people. So I would be, I would be moving that shelter foundation thing up there. Absolutely fabulous. If you're doing community events, this is the sort of stuff. Now I usually put this sort of stuff up at the beginning, or this is absolutely awesome stuff, information for your seller's book. So all of the things that make Royal LePage great, all the charity works in that, I think that's really good in your initial seller's book. Okay, it's sometimes good to point that out when you're going through a presentation, but that's not directly helping them sell their house. And people that, you know, see that and people that, you know, like, again, you're sitting there to make it about them. So some people, you know, for the ones that this really does matter, uh, I probably have it in my seller booklet to be more effective. Okay. And you talk about getting the pros to start. So really good set uh, template to get to get the ball rolling. Okay. Do you have any questions? Um, that is basically everything. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Is there anything as far as processes? Has anyone had a listing presentation that didn't go right lately that we can kind of talk about? Anything about the marketing? No, yes. I'm going to give it another 10 seconds. And if not, then, uh, then it's just been fun, folks. Sounds like everything was perfect. So I'm glad. Hi, I, I have really... a question. Yeah, perfect timing. Uh, go ahead. 
No, I was just looking at my notes, trying to refresh my memory as we as you went along. I kind of took some um, put down some questions for myself. So. Um, a lot of these listening presentations are targeted towards having a signature at the end of the day, yes. you know, putting it down on paper. Now, a uh, majority of our paperwork is done um, online, DocuSign or whichever other platform. So how do you approach it from a digital perspective to get the closing signature? Well, if you're actually physically going to the house and sitting like, because obviously at this exact moment in time, things will change between now and hopefully four months from now, right? With with more uh, vaccine circulation and things like that, where face-to-face -face listing appointments and things like that become uh, much more viable. So um, if you're going to do it, di like if I'm doing face-to-face, -face, I'm bringing paper is it, basically how I would do it. Um, I would be bringing paper versions. Um, if you want to do it digitally, even though it's face to face, then I would be walking through the paperwork then, then, then and there. So let's say, just to kind of let, let's create a situation, Luba. So I did a walkthrough of the house and then I did a Zoom appointment. And in that Zoom appointment, I'm trying to get it signed. Okay, and uh, you can try to do this even when you do buyer consultations, right? You want to still walk out with a BRA. So um, I ha would have everything ready to go beforehand. I would have I would have everything filled out, um, and then I would be, uh, and then at this point when I hit the end of the presentation, okay. So all we have to do is just a little bit of paperwork, and then that way I can start ordering our market. You know, my my I can plan a date with our photography people, etc. Okay, when I go through the marketing and the time, what I used to do as far as, uh, um, uh, as far as what I used to do as, um, sorry, I lost my thing. Um, sorry, I totally lost my train of thought, but uh, I, I see that's what I get for reading the chat. So the other thing I, with that uh, was just pointed out too, is that you can also do sign in person if you want to just do it digitally in person. Um, but the other way as well is, oh yeah, um, when I get to my marketing point, what I was remembering before is when I'm going through my marketing, usually I try to open up my calendar and we kind of set a soft date. So, you know, it's going to, we're going to have to clean up. I can have my made through and in about a week. So we're probably ready to list on, say, you know, March 15th. Would you agree? So I've already done like a soft close as far as when does the listing go live. So I do that back in the marketing phase. So um, once I kind of got all that set up, um, I'll, I would fill out all the paperwork ahead of time already. And then I would send it to them in that appointment and have them digitally sign it. Right. You know, sometimes it doesn't, you know, they'll say like email it to us and we'll let you know, like it's, you know, let's face it. It's, it's a little bit more of a challenge doing it digitally, but there's nothing stopping you, right? It's a great opportunity. We need to, as realtors, review all the paperwork at that time. So why don't we, you know, like we, we send them the digital thing and as they're clicking the buttons, we're going through all the details. Okay. Right? It, it, Thank you. Okay. No problem. Luba. Is there is there any thoughts on how, um, you know, I've heard that some agents are paying for staging, paying for other services and so on, and somehow work out the deal with the sellers that, um, on that the seller pays for it, but then on closing, somehow those costs will be adjusted. How is that really handled? So there's a couple different ways. So let's just talk about big expenses because there was a question here also from Elizabeth that if the home's a little dated, do you recommend having upgrades done and things like that? Um, it's very much a case-to-case -case basis, Elizabeth. Uh, I sorry, your question is a little different um, because I'm, I don't know if you're. I don't think you're suggesting that uh, the agent pay for that. Um, but it really depends on the person and things like that. So sorry, I'm going to go to Elizabeth's question second. Okay. So, so Luba, your question was. Um, um, sorry? How do we adjust? Well, for example, sometimes um, the, the listing needs staging, some other updates, and then you're paying for videos and photography yes. and a few other things. So two different ways you can split that up. Yeah. So photography and videos and some of the more basic stuff, you should just you, you should just have that in your listing package. That's the risk and gambling you take when you take a listing. 
Yeah. I think this goes more into when you get into large amounts of staging um, or you're doing larger, maybe you're paying for larger repairs on the house that can equal thousands of dollars. So they could pay it up, either they pay it up front. And what you're doing is on closing, you're basically writing them a check, getting a, getting, um, a receipt and then writing them and then uh, writing that off your taxes. Is how, is how you would handle that. Left in a schedule, in a listing schedule? Mm, you could do that through a listing schedule, yes. Right, you know, like you, you want, so they would want something in writing. Like you obviously want something in writing. They would want something in writing. Okay. So um, the other option is if you're going to pay for a lot of this up front because they don't have the money, then is you getting a similar document, but saying that if the house doesn't sell, they're going to reimburse you. Okay. And also knowing that if you end up like, hopefully you don't have to, and in a lot of cases, the paperwork, you know, people are going to honor their word, but just keep in mind, if you do have to pursue that money, then you're doing it through small claims court. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. No problem. So uh, Elizabeth's question, sorry, Elizabeth, I tried to group you in and it was wrong. If the seller's home's a little dated, so it can be a sliding slope. Um, you are right, I was not suggesting I would pick up the cost. So that's right. So Elizabeth, it can be a sliding slope because it's like, well, do you do this? And then you should just do this. And then you do, and it's just all of a sudden you've just done the whole house and you're only selling perfect homes. And trust me, you know, every uh, people that do flip houses will tell you not every flip just because it's a nicely done goes perfectly because then now people have to take it as is. Sometimes having something with a kitchen, rent, like especially, like I, people love, and I even love like grandma's house. And, and I know, let me, let me clarify. Like, you know, I always found grandparents when people hit a certain age, they'll stop renovating their kitchen. They'll maybe keep the same carpeting for a long period. It's the same bathroom, but the electrical and the roof is just perfect. And all the outside is meticulously taken care of in that. So, you know, is it worth doing it in those cases? Like I would rather price it better and, and because nowadays I find even first time buyers aren't afraid of getting into these projects because they just need to get into the market. So uh, I, I per, you know, it, it depends. It's on a case by case basis. And, and then, of course, if the person is a trades person and they can do certain things for a lot cheaper, then so maybe it is worth doing a couple things. Right. But then sometimes it's like, well, it's sometimes worth going the other round and just ripping stuff. Like sometimes it's really old carpet, but the hardwood's half decent. So you just rip out the carpet and have this exposed hardwood that's ready to be refinished. Or maybe refinishing it is actually a half that and repainting the room is actually worth it. But it, it again, it really depends on, on a property by property basis. Okay. Could real and also you don't want the renos like on a salesperson side. You don't want all of a sudden you talk them into redoing their bathroom and this and that. And maybe the the renovator doesn't do a good job and it doesn't look great and they start blaming you. Or it takes two months to do it and in that time they need another realtor and you lose the listing. Like there, there's all these different things that could happen, right? So I would, you know, if they're going to go that route, I'd still try to get the paperwork first. But, um, you know, they're, it, you know, if they're ready to go, you know, always try to work with what they have unless a couple little things would really make a big difference. Uh, I do know, I have heard of agents that offer to do really big amounts of projects ahead of time. And, you know, there's, and they have different agreements in that, but it's, that's not nothing I've ever really tackled. Okay. Did I miss anything? My last question would be, is this a template for the listing presentation? I may have missed this in the beginning. The, the listing presentation template uh, is this one here. Sorry, I'm just moving some windows. And this is in the link that has been posted. Oh, so it's all in the same folder. Fantastic. This is really helpful, Nathan. Thank you. So I suggest put something together, put together a rough copy and then book some time with your manager, right? And, and, and role play with them. If, if you're nervous about doing it with them first, do it with your cat, right? Do it with your, do it with your next door neighbor outside over a beer, over a beer, right? Just, you know, again, the repetition, no matter what part, the repetition of the wording is what creates the familiarity that allows you. Because if you're stammering through your whole thing, you, you've lost that power of, of being the professional. Okay. Thanks again. Pleasure. Thank you so much, everybody. I hope you have a fantastic day and uh, all the best. Okay. Happy hunting.